If you clicked on this video, there's a good chance that you watched George Clooney's latest interview with Jimmy Kimmel, where he sort of shared his struggle with facial paralysis in his youth. There's also another mega celebrity that suffered from the same condition about a year ago. I'm gonna cover his story later in the video. But since this has become more of a common occurrence in Hollywood, I thought of making a video discussing how it actually works and how it happens. Uh, what to do if this has ever happened to you and most importantly, how do you even know that you have facial paralysis? Before going through what happened with George Clooney's face, a good place to start from is to get an idea about what a facial paralysis even looks like. Take a look at my beautiful face. And take note that a lot of muscle groups are now in synchronized contraction and relaxation so that my face appears this way. That complexity even amplifies when I try to blink, smile, or try to do any facial expression. Now imagine that the nerve innervating a lot of those group muscles suddenly stops working. And that commonly happens to the seventh cranial nerve, also known as the facial cranial nerve. We have two facial nerves in our bodies, one innervating the right side of our face and one innervating the left side. One useful test to do at home to sort of assess the function of the seventh cranial nerve is to stand in front of a mirror and try to do different facial expressions. Patients with facial paralysis often find it harder to smile, blink, puff their cheeks out, they'll notice loss in their nasal labial folds in their effective side, and they'll also notice liver drooling. They'll also often describe uncomfortable sensation around loud noises and music, and that's due to loss of function of the stapedius muscle, a skeletal muscle responsible for sound modulation. Now from the few pictures we've got about George Clooney's face paralysis in his youth, it seems to be affecting the entire left side of his face, which basically indicates a peripheral facial paralysis. I'm only saying that because the paralysis of only the lower part of the face would indicate a central facial paralysis. Let me explain the difference. Remember we said before that we have two facial nerves, one innervating each side of our face? Well, you also have to know that unlike the lower part of the face, the forehead receives double innervation actually from the two facial nerves. So if you knock out the facial nerve centrally, like in what happens in cortical strokes, for example, you'll actually only cut the innervation to the lower part of the face, but the forehead will still be innervated by the contralateral facial nerve, resulting in a paralysis that only affects the lower part of one side of the face. You don't really have to memorize and fully understand what I just said. It's enough to remember three things. First, facial paralysis only occurs in one side of the face, usually. Second, if you have a paralysis of the entire side of the face, that's a peripheral paralysis. If you have a paralysis of only the lower part, that's central. Third, peripheral paralysis is usually the good news in terms of prognosis. It's usually the more benign, less alarming, and reversible version of facial paralysis. Don't get me wrong, I said usually, not always, because peripheral paralysis can also be caused by strokes called non-cortical strokes. But usually it is caused by a condition called Bell's palsy. This is the same condition that affected Justin Bieber in 2020, if you remember. And has caused my face to have paralysis. As you can see, this eye is not blinking. I can't smile on this side of my face. This nostril will not move. So there's full paralysis in this side of my face. This is a benign condition and full movement of the face usually returns in about one to six months of the onset of symptoms. There are some case reports in the literature that talk about some permanent loss of function after Bell's palsy, but usually administering glucocorticoids and aciclovir are associated with a better recovery function. Glucocorticoids because of their anti-inflammatory effect and aciclovir, well, it's an antiviral medication that's most effective against HSV viruses, human simplex virus. This is the virus that we believe responsible for this condition, for Bell's palsy. And before you start Googling and trying to find some ways to protect yourself from getting infected with this virus, let me just inform you that you already probably have it. Have you ever had cold sores, these painful blisters in your lips? Well, that's a symptom of HSV. Unfortunately, about 70% of the global population is infected with HSV. You probably had it in your teenage years and it's been hiding ever since in your neural ganglia. 
and upon activation it can cause these painful cold sores that we are all familiar with but it can also cause Bell's palsy so this is the underlying mechanism behind it or at least that's what I've been taught in medical school because in the process of making this video I came across two papers that assessed the use of prednisolone, a glucocorticoid and aciclavir for the treatment of Bell's palsy and the Two papers affirmed the efficacy of glucocorticoids of prednisolone but denied any statistical significant advantage of using aciclavir. If any one of you is familiar with any more data or maybe a recent study, please make sure to put it in the comment section. I will be thankful for that. So yeah, the happy ending of the story is that George Clooney had peripheral facial paralysis in his youth and thankfully he grew up healthy to become the great actor that we all know and we all love. So this is what I wanted to talk about in this video. If you found this video informative, please make sure to press the like button, subscribe if you haven't yet, and uh, as always, stay safe.